Okay, the committee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. And I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. So, uh, back in March of 2019, this committee held its very first hearing. The hearing's focus was on past reform efforts, so it's only fitting that as we meet today for the committee's last hearing, our focus is on future reform efforts. Uh, we've come full circle. Uh, uh, it is hard to believe that this committee will soon be one of those past reform efforts that we looked to for guidance and inspiration just three and a half years ago. My hope is that we've given future reformers plenty to think about, not only in terms of the recommendations that we've passed, but in terms of how we've worked. I, I can't emphasize enough how the processes and norms that we've developed along the way have been key to our success as a committee. I think that our work methods deserve just as much attention as our work product. And I really hope future reformers take note of that because more folks recognize that it's possible for Democrats and Republicans to find areas of agreement, to collaborate in good faith, and to produce results on behalf of the American people, uh, the better. One of the biggest lessons I've learned over the past three and a half years is that if we want things to work differently, we have to be willing to do things differently. I know it's hard to try new things in a tradition-bound institution like Congress, but experimenting is absolutely essential if we're going to change anything. We didn't know if some of the things our committee tried would work, but we were willing to experiment and find out. In fact, the reason that we're sitting here today in a roundtable format where we can all look each other in the eye and engage in substantive discussion is because the committee decided to try something new. Over one year ago when the committee held its first roundtable hearing, we had no idea how it would go, but we took a chance and we haven't returned to the dais since, except when we had technical difficulties one time. Uh, modernization requires a willingness to innovate, and that's what this committee has done from day one. I recall being at an Armed Forces Day dinner in my district a few years back and speaking with a senior naval officer, and he said, how's it going in Congress? And I said, man, it feels like trying to turn a battleship. And he said, well, Derek, I used to captain a battleship. And he said, here's what I can tell you, targeted and strategic course correction over time can make a really big difference. I say that because change doesn't happen overnight, especially in a place like Congress, but I think that the small changes over time can lead to the kind of cultural shifts that make a big difference. What started as a one-year sprint for this committee turned into a four-year marathon, and I'm grateful that we were given the time to do the work necessary to create long-term change. In fact, we already we are already seeing our hard work pay off as more than half of our recommendations have either been fully or partially implemented. This success is due in no small part to the hard work of the committee's implementation partners, including the CAO who is with us today. By working closely with the CAO, the House Clerk, and the Architect of the Capitol, among others, the committee was able to draft workable recommendations that our partners could successfully implement. This unique approach to developing and implementing recommendations is another committee innovation. While some of our successes are already apparent, there's a lot of work ahead, and it won't always be easy to determine whether some of our recommendations made a difference. Measuring success is tough. When we lack the hard data, we need to confidently claim that something actually did what it was supposed to do, but it's not impossible, and one of our witnesses today is gonna help us think creatively about how to gauge the impact of our work over time. I frequently made the point that modernization should happen as a matter of course. Businesses and organizations build innovation and process improvement into their operations because they understand that evolving with the times is necessary in order to remain relevant. By relegating reform to something it does every few decades or so, Congress is consistently playing catch up. Outdated technology and processes slow the institution down and that is a disservice to the American people. There are however ways Congress can make modernization an ongoing rather than occasional effort and one of our witnesses today is gonna to present us with a few potential options for continuing the work that this committee started. The committee will use its, this is the wonky part, the committee will use its rules that allow for a more flexible hearing format that encourages discussion in the civil exchange of ideas and opinions. So, in accordance with clause 2J of House Rule 11, we will allow up to 30 minutes of extended questioning per witness, and without objection, time will not be strictly segregated between the witnesses, which will allow for extended back and forth exchanges between members and the witnesses. Vice Chair Timmons and I will manage the time to ensure that every member has equal opportunity to participate Additionally, members who wish to claim their individual five minutes to question each witness pursuant to Clause 2J2 of Rule 11 will be permitted to do so following the period of extended questioning. Okay, that out of the way, I'd like to invite Vice Chair Timmons to share some opening remarks as well. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Thank you all for being with us. It, it really has been a wild ride. Three and a half years ago, I was appointed as the freshman on this committee. And I remember how happy I was when Leader McCarthy's office called and told me that. And Tom Graves had been a friend and, and mentor, and I was so fortunate to spend a year and then two years um, under his leadership and under the chairman's leadership. And I, I watched them work together. I watched them show me that 
Republicans and Democrats can be civil, can work together, and can try to make a positive impact on the institution that everyone loves. It's, it has such a huge impact on uh, the lives of the American people. It's so important that we do everything we can to make this place as functional as possible. So uh, I was very pleased when the uh, leader told me that I was going to be the vice chair. He didn't really have a lot of options. Um, everybody that was on the committee that was a Republican had left, and Rodney can't have more committee assignments. It would be ridiculous to have his fifth or sixth. I don't even know what number it would be. But um, I've done everything I can to, to step into the shoes of, of Tom Graves. Um, you know, I always remark his hair is so great that I, I knew I could never live up to that. He just has the best head of hair. But, um, you know, I, I did my best to continue um, the, the, the leadership that this committee has had, and we were so fortunate to get a full two years. And I think we've made the most of it. And we have four months left, and we're going to continue to work hard. Um, obviously, this, this hearing is about what's next and how do we make sure that the recommendations that we have made and that we will make will be fully implemented. And uh, while we will not be here in January, um, how can we maximize the likelihood that all of these recommendations get implemented? Um, I know that we all have some ideas on that, and that's what we'll be talking about. But I definitely think that this shouldn't happen every couple decades. And I definitely think that we shouldn't stop in January. So um, I look forward to hearing y'all's thoughts on that. I will also remark, we just went on a congressional delegation trip uh, to Brussels and to um, London. And, you know, we have, it was remarkable that uh, I actually think we're doing okay after that trip. Not, <laughs> not that the EU and the UK are, are not doing a, a great job in their own way, but everyone has their dysfunction. Everyone has their challenges. Um, the EU takes a week, a month, and goes four and a half hours away by train to a different location to conduct their business. And I just was like, wow. And I thought we had it tough in DC. Um, but we learned a lot too. We learned a lot and we're hopefully gonna make some recommendations uh, from what we learned from our um, the parliaments in, in London and then in Brussels. So it was a very productive trip. Um, I just wanna say how, since this is the last hearing, I just wanna say that it's been an honor to work alongside the chair. Um, we have become friends and I feel like we have made an impact and we're gonna to continue to work hard for the next four months. And I can assure as long as I'm in Congress, I will work until every one of these recommendations has been fully implemented. And I, I think we, we agree on that. So uh, Mr. Chairman, I just say it's been an honor. Look forward to the next four months and look forward to the hearing here today. With that, I yield back. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate your remarks and um, appreciate the partnership. Then. Uh, I'll wait till we get to our final uh, markup before I say any valedictory remarks. Um, I want to uh, welcome our guests, but before I do, I want to uh, welcome two particularly important guests today. Huck and Charlie are with us. They are the kids of one of our witnesses today. They are two of the most well-attired and well-behaved kids I've ever seen. So um, thank you for being with us, Huck and Charlie. And I told them if things got boring, they should just like make a bird noise and I'll try to pick it up a little bit. So um, that was a joke though, Charlie. So don't actually, <laughs> don't actually make a bird noise, okay? All right, like she gave me the nod. So um, I now would like to welcome our three witnesses who are here to share their thoughts on the future of modernization within this institution. Witnesses are reminded that your written statements will be made part of the record. Our fir first witness is a frequent flyer with uh, the committee. I think you've now qualified for the free latte as well. Um, we are deeply grateful for her service and work with the committee. Catherine Spinder is the Chief Administrative Officer of the House of Representatives. She served in this role since 2020. Previously, she serves as the CIO for the House in her role. Ms. Spinder is responsible for providing support services and business solutions to a community of 10,000 House members, officers, and staff. Uh, Ms. Spinder, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, and the members of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Thank you for this opportunity today and many opportunities we've had previously to meet for the good of the institution. We thank you for trusting the CAO as a partner in making lasting positive changes so that Congress can run more effectively and efficiently. The mission of the nearly 800 CAO staffers is actually very simple. It is to make 
it easier for members and staff to do their job as they serve the American people. We refer to this as member-focused, service-driven. Our varied and highly skilled staff work as one CAO to perform our services so you, the members of Congress, can focus on your constitutional duties. Since January 2022, we have launched many new projects. I am highlighting a few of those today. The very successful CAO coach program is addressing the need for more relevant and efficient training for House staff by hosting in-person and virtual courses and providing one-on-one -on -one consultations to staff in Washington, D.C. and the district. In total, CAO Coach hosted 2,600 House staffers in these sessions. The CAO Coaches and Customer Advocates launched the first ever bipartisan orientation program for new staff in February and developed the 2022 District Office Conference Program, also bipartisan, providing specialty training to over 800 district staff by position. We train staff on specific skills unique to the House and plan on these, continuing these offerings in the coming year. This team serves as an effective method in communicating CAO services and products and how to access them. We continue to update and add new products to the House Human Resources Hub, which is quickly becoming an essential resource for managing op office operations. The House Resume Bank is providing offices an easier and quicker way to find job candidates. Effective use of the resume bank has led to requests from chiefs of staff for more effective methods to attract diverse and talented applicants, and we, tend, we will deliver. The House Digital Service Team is committed to a build with and not build for philosophy for stakeholders to ensure products meet customer criteria they are researching member committee office needs. This includes improvements to constituent services, legislative tools, office operational functions, such as a leave tracking software for member offices, options for a legislative branch-wide staff directory, and a common committee calendar portal to help reduce schedule conflict. The CAO is conducting research on replacement options and cost estimates for a new House payroll system since the current system is nearing end of life. Through this project, we will modernize antiquated processes, automate manual procedures, and improve the payroll experience. Also, this will be an opportunity to consider transitioning to a more frequent pay cycle for House employees a recommendation by the select committee. The Office of Finance is piloting an application employing electronic signatures to automate many of our administrative forms. The new system launches soon and provides House offices the ability to electronically, electronically prepare, approve, route, and submit payroll transactions. These transactions are validated in real time against House rules and regulations providing considerable time savings to that office. To keep our promise to be member-focused, service-driven, the CAO adopted a new strategic plan that is focused on understanding the needs of the members and the staff, continuously improving our services and processes to meet those needs, and effectively analyzing and prioritizing our budgeted funds and resources to provide quality solutions. Additionally, the modernization account, the select committee champion, provides a significant opportunity for the House to continue to transform ser services. Chairman Kilmer and Vice Chairman Timmons, the modernization momentum you created propels us forward and our future is clear. The CAO has integrated modernization into our overall operations. We are enthusiastic and deliberate in our plan to continue to meet the evolving needs of the members and staff. 
I am grateful for your support, the great working relationship that we have with your staff, and look forward to responding to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fender, for your testimony and for your partnership. Our next witness is Dr. Casey Burgat. Uh, in addition to being the father of Huck and Charlie, uh, Dr. Burgett is the director of the Legislative Affairs Program and assistant professor in the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University. He previously served as a senior governance, governance fellow at the R Street Institute, as well as an analyst with the Congressional Research Service in the Executive Branch Operations and the Congress and Judiciary sections. Dr. Burgett, welcome. You are now recognized for five minutes. Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, and members of the Select Committee, Thank you for the invitation to testify this morning. I, like everyone here, I can imagine, followed the work of your committee closely since its inception. I know I speak for many in the reform community. Diane's gonna echo this, I'm sure, that we applaud all of your leadership on all of these topics, especially in these political circumstances. We applaud not only the committee's robust productivity, but maybe even more importantly, the example is set about how it's gone about its work. It has been civil. It has been purposefully bipartisan, and it has been thorough. Thank you all for all setting this example. Right, Huck and Charlie? <laughs> I, asked, I was asked to focus my testimony on two primary questions. First, how might current and future congressional reform researchers measure the effectiveness of this committee's work, especially over time, and including the impacts of your nearly 200 recommendations? And second, Given that I have re regularly tasked my students to research and propose recommendations for the select committee to consider, what common themes typically have come up in their proposals? Starting with the first question regarding your effectiveness. Some of your recommendations and resulting progress are quantifiable and thus can be studied as such. That part's easy. The impacts of increasing staff pay, diversity, internship ac and accessibility, for example, can be measured and compared with Congress's that came before, before these changes. Other recommendations, however, are much more difficult to quantify. Goals such as encouraging civility within Congress, modernizing technology, improving constituent service processes don't come with clear measures or, and this is the important part, publicly accessible data. On many issues, the causal chain between the committee's recommendations to tangible outcomes will be long, imprecise, and conditional on an infinite number of variables. And academics are allergic to those qualities. With that said, there are a, a, a host of types of measures that scholars may use to gauge the committee's effectiveness over time. Those who focus on legislative productivity and outcomes may look for changes in amendment and drafting activities. Does co-sponsor action differ in numbers and networks, potentially cross-party counts? thanks to the electronic co-sponsor recommendation and your civility efforts? Are members more able to insert legislative text into bills because the collaborative legislative drafting recommendation? Do members in offices seem to work together more often than attend after attending bipartisan onboarding and new member orientations? These are things that we can kind of get at with proxy measures, though there aren't easily quantifiable data attached. On the oversight front, Enterprising researchers can study whether more bipartisan oversight efforts, including identifiers like letters signed by both the chair and ranking member, are undertaken. And then should certain panels follow the select committee's lead in deliberations, such as this roundtable format, the bipartisan seating, foregoing the five-minute rule, studies can analyze differences and outcomes on a variety of de deliberation measures. So things like uh, what witnesses are called to testify, using text analysis of hearing transcripts to study what types of questions are asked because there are infinite types, infinite types of different questions to be asked, and how you all use your allotted time. Will that change? And because, precisely because members will be hard, measures will be hard to come by, it's key researchers do not discount the importance of qualitative study as well. To fully understand why certain outcomes differ, there's no substitute for hearing directly from the source, member or staff, of your thinking, motivations, and observations. This does mean, though, that you will all make yourselves available, your staff's available, and your data is available as possible so that we annoying academics who work on these questions can get some answers without having to bug you too much. 
Now, the second question about when assigning my students to submit reform proposals, what common themes have developed? Many students, unsurprisingly, want to focus on improving collaboration and civility between members, staffers, and offices. Half want to use sticks, like fines, and decrease resources for offenders. The other half want to use carrots, like access to the floor, or maybe a civility plaque in the Capitol hallways. Almost all require members to judge each other on their behaviors, which history has shown us over and over, brings a whole host of challenges and implications. Students also commonly submit proposals to reform the budget process. Their reform ideas attempt to lessen the reliance on continuing resolutions, reinvigorating authorizing committees, improving budgetary oversight, minimizing deficit spending, and doing away with high debt, high drama debt ceiling fights. I bet you all would sign on to all of those things as well. But by far, and by far, the most common theme of student reform proposals speak to the overwhelming centralization of legislating power in leadership offices. It simply doesn't com compute to my students that rank and file members are commonly not involved in the legislative process and sometimes completely in the dark on policy negotiations and even legislative text until the final moments prior to votes. They can't understand why bills that would assuredly pass the chamber won't get debated, let alone receive attention on the floor. After much discussion, they begin to theoretically understand how the current balance of power serves enough interests of enough members, but they hate it. They don't understand it. They don't accept it. To them, many of the current processes are, in fact, antithetical to how the legislature is supposed to work. Their solutions to the problem are unbelievably varied, though. From pie-in-the-sky pledges that every member read every bill before granting access to um, granting floor access to every member at least once per session. Increasingly, student reform ideas attempt to tackle the doom loop felt by many members, particularly within the minority party. They think, if I don't see a reasonable path as a member to the floor for my issue, and if leadership decides everything anyway, why would I spend my time, my energy, my staff resources legislating? Aren't I better off messaging and performing constituent service? Their incentive structure is hard to argue with. To address this, many proposals advance altering house rules and instituting automatic thresholds that guarantee subsequent actions, like a markup within committee or a vote on the floor. Ideas like work, reworking the discharge petition, identifying a certain magic number of co-sponsors or bipartisan co-sponsors that would automatically trigger a definite path to the policy making process, including access to the floor. In nearly all of these thoughts, though, Students are quick to point out that leadership cannot be given a veto, can't even give them access to it. If the specific threshold is met, the member receives the reward. I assume you have questions about this. I'll save the rest for later, but thank you all again for the invitation to testify, and I would be remiss um, if I didn't take this opportunity to implore you to do everything possible to make those, this committee, in whatever format it can take, permanent. It matters. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Burgett. Uh, our final witness is Diane Hill, who's a senior manager at the Partnership for Public Service. She previously served as a presidential management fellow at the Department of Housing and Urban Development as a program analyst at the Environmental Protection Agency and as a legislative staffer for Congresswoman Lindy Boggs, Congressman Pat Williams, and Senator Bob Kerry. Ms. Hill, you are now recognized for five minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Kilmer. Uh, Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here today to testify. Determining a future for the modernization movement that this committee has created is necessary and important. As Chair Kilmer said, my name is Diane Hill. I am a senior manager at the Partnership for Public Service, but I am privileged to be the coordinator for the Fixed Congress cohort, a community of 45 civil society organizations who align in a common purpose to strengthen Congress and make it more effective. We've been thankful and privileged to be able to work with this committee and want to thank you for all the hard work that you've done. Now, as you can imagine, being the coordinator for 45 civil society organizations who want to make a significant change in the world and make a difference, it's not easy to come up with a consensus about where we should go next with the modernization effort. So our recommendations today have a framework. Our first thing that we all do agree on is we want to make sure that the recommendations almost 200 of them that you have worked so hard to put together are implemented, while also identifying new areas for reform. 
Second, we believe that we need to continue efforts to bring the Senate into the modernization work. What you'll hear from me today. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a hard one, but, but we're committed to it. Um, with that in mind, uh, we make the following recommendations. And as I stated, it's not easy to get consensus. So our first two recommendations are alternatives of where the modernization effort should be housed. Recommendation number one is to place modernization work within the House Committee on House Administration, either by establishing a new subcommittee or a commission. Giving the work to the House Administration makes a permanent home with a committee that has significant jurisdiction over most of the recommendations that have come out of this committee. It also provides a space where hearings can occur and we can find, explore, and develop new recommendations. So there are two options we could do that within the Committee on House Administration. One is to create a subcommittee on modernization at the beginning of the next Congress. The makeup of that subcommittee would be all House Administration members. The second is to establish a modernization commission modeled on the structure of the Communication Standards Commission. While both are strong options, and you'll see all the disadvantages and advantages of both in my written testimony, the commission has the potential to be truly bipartisan. You could have uh, members of both party in equal numbers and also has the possibility of membership from the entire House of Representatives, as does the uh, Commission on Communication Standards, the Communication Standards Commission. The second recommendation, and you'll remember that this is an alternative to the first, is that we reauthorize the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. As I uh, agree um, with my colleague, Case, Dr. Burgott, um, it would, this committee has done such stellar work, it would be nice to have a permanent organization just like it. It's provided a model, a pathway for other committees to see how thorny issues can be explored fully and respectfully by members who don't necessarily agree but are seeking ways to find common solutions. The makeup of this bipartisan committee brings together members of key committees who have direct jurisdiction over House operations. The Committee on House Administration, Appropriations, and the Rules Committee. The collaboration and communication between these three committees needs to continue and will fully support a modernization effort. Our third recommendation is to create a permanent modernization task force in addition to a member-based solution. So this would be an add-on. The task force would be formed using the data task force as a model made up of nonpartisan professional staff from across legislative agencies, including the Government Accountability Office, the Office of the Chief Administrative Officer, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the Clerk's Office, and the Sergeant at Arms. By pulling together professional staff who are able to serve across Congresses, Members would have an expert resource on modernization to both implement existing recommendations and develop new recommendations on an ongoing basis. And the fourth recommendation is to pursue a joint committee on the modernization of Congress. Ideally, modernization of Congress would include all of Congress. Yeah, okay, no, I'm still there. Okay, sorry, I, I must have, um, my apologies. For that reason, uh, the cohort supports creation of a joint committee on the modernization of Congress. While it appears that the Senate's not ready to take that step right now, we should be exploring that goal in the long term. In that way, we can take on larger issues like budget reform, which would help Congress regain its strength and footing as the first branch of government. I want to thank you again for inviting me to testify, but I also want to thank you most sincerely for allowing this community of civil society organizations to be instrumental in the modernization effort. We applaud the strong leadership, service, and results of the work of this committee, and we are grateful that this committee has been willing to stand by Congress as an institution, and we wholeheartedly support that effort. Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Hill, and uh, thank you uh, not just for your testimony, but for your partnership and for the partnership of the cohort. Thank you for that. Um, I now recognize myself and Vice Chair Timmons to begin a period of extended questioning of the witnesses. Any member who wishes to speak should just signal their request to either me or Vice Chair Timmons. Um, and I'm going to be here the whole time, so I'm going to let you all go first, assuming folks may have to leave. I know Vice, uh, I know um, Chairman Lofgren is on via Zoom as well. I don't know if she's been elevated to participate. 
So um, I saw uh, Rodney's hand go up first, so go ahead, Mr. Davis, and then I got you, Ms. Williams, and then you can have Rodney. Anybody on the list? That's right there, Chairman Kilmer, is just great leadership because he's going to be here the entire time. We, of course, like to come in and out, which makes Congress very functional, of course. Um, <laughs> But he recognized that I raised my hand first. And I really appreciate your leadership. On that. I really do. I'd like to appreciate your speed, yeah. uh, Mr. Davis. Hey, uh, in, in, all, in, in all seriousness, um, as somebody who's been on this select committee since its inception and as somebody who also you know, has the role on House administration, uh, what Derek has done uh, over the last two Congresses is, is miraculous. He's been able to really drive a bipartisan message to success. We've had tremendous successes um, last Congress and this Congress, recommendations being implemented through this, uh, through this process, and to have the leadership that Derek had in the majority to give then Vice Chair Graves, and now Vice Chair Timmons, somewhat equal status is, is unheard of. I mean, this is the stuff that your students think Congress is about. And that's why it's great to use this select committee as an example. But as we all know, it's not the rest of Congress. Um, and that's really due to your leadership and your team's leadership, Derek. And it would have been driven. Exceptional job as a chair. And again, uh, William, you know, exceptionally mediocre job. <laughs> uh, but I do want to say, I do want to say, in all seriousness, um, the list of recommendations that were implemented throughout this committee's process cannot be overstated. And I will, I will say and argue that most of them happened before Pearl Mutter got on the committee. <laughs> yes. um, but, you know, we've slowly moved ahead. We can't stop that. And I'm really interested in the recommendations of how to extend this process. Um, Chair Kilmer and Vice Chair Timmons and everybody on this committee knows where I stand. Uh, as a member of the House Administration Committee, we should be tasked with implementing a lot more of these recommendations. And that to me is the most logical place for a permanent subcommittee on that, on the Committee on House Administration to focus solely on making this institution better. Because that is the standing committee in the House that should be focused on making this institution better. We, we, we hear what some may say pie in the sky discussions about how do we get the Senate to work. You know what, we could do that through joint interaction with the Senate Rules Committee. But let's make sure that we highlight the fact that the discussions and the debates that we have here and the successes, they have got to continue. I'm not going to continue. Ed's not going to continue. It's going to be up to those of you who are here in this institution to make sure that the great work these folks have, have put in and the staffers have put in uh, isn't forgotten. I'd like to see, and. Look, as we plan ahead to what we call our roadmap to the majority, and I've laid out my priorities to my hopeful successors um, that would create a subcommittee on modernization with the, within the Committee on House Administration. Certainly hope to be able to populate that subcommittee. We might be able to get some more members on House Administration. Um, but then House Administration has got to do its job, and that means we've got to have a continued focus um, from members who are on this subcommittee who may want to engage and be members of the House Administration Committee. Because that's where you can actually get a lot of these recommendations that are sitting, waiting to be implemented, done. The low-hanging fruit is gone. It's going to be more contentious. But the committee process is the place to work it out, and I certainly hope it's done in a bipartisan way. Catherine, I want to thank you and your team for implementing a lot of our recommendations over the last three and a half years. Um, I've worked with you as a staffer. I've wor or worked with your, your operation as a staffer years ago. I, you know I have my, my, uh, my opinions on where things should be technologically, um, and I know you're moving in that direction, uh, in spite of having John Clocker, who's sitting up in the corner as part of your team. Uh, hi, John. <laughs> He's taking a shot at everybody. Hey, I, I wouldn't say it if I didn't love you, buddy. Uh, but in all seriousness, you know better than most uh, how difficult it can be to have a mod comm and have a House Administration Committee pull you and your team in different directions. I want to ask you, let's say there's a subcommittee 
on modernization on House administration? Is it easier then to have a single point of contact through that committee to be able to focus on implementing recommendations? Or do you think a better setup could exist? I think that certainly could be beneficial to us uh, as long as everyone is supporting the recommendations that are being made. Um, I, I think that there has to be some type of structure there. I agree with you. Because we have to know where to take our direction from overall. And I, um, I you know, work closely with the House Committee on Administration. We've worked closely with you. But I think going forward, the most important thing that you, you have done, quite frankly, is given us an ability to get the information, get the direction that we need on some of these recommendations to be able to implement them. One of the primary things in any type of project that you try to do is making sure that your stakeholders are actively engaged in what you are doing. If you don't have that, it's very, very hard to get anything done. And quite frankly, I believe one of the reasons over the years we have sometimes not always uh, proved successful in delivering solutions is because we didn't have that contact. We didn't have individuals there behind us helping us, championing us to move forward with that. And um, so however it's organized, we need that support you, going you, forward. You, you need that support, and, and that's my point. I'm going to end with this. Um, this place is set up to have a structure for final decisions. And this committee is great at recommendations, but the problem is there's a next step because House administration has to approve a lot of those recommendations. So to me, let's get that finality in place that allows you and your teams and the other officers to be able to know what their final direction is. Um, we can have the discussions, the debates on what's going to work on that subcommittee of modernization. We can do the exact same things here. But we also, there comes time for a vote. And when that vote is had, the decision is final, and you and your team know what direction you have. That, to me, is the best way that we can move this institution forward and get some of these great ideas into house operations. So I want to say thanks. It's been a pleasure to serve with each and every one of you. Um, I'm humbled by the opportunity to be able to play a small role in making this place better. And I certainly know that as we move on, there's going to be a tremendous amount of activity of folks who are more interested in making Congress work because of the work that all of you are doing. But even, I, I, I wanna say to my colleagues who have been a part of this, you guys are the future. You're the ones that are gonna have to continue what we started here. And I'm always here to, uh, always here to offer advice, uh, but we're gonna be watching. And I'm proud of each and every one of you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve with you. I yield back. Thank you. I know we've got uh, Chair Lofgren on via Zoom. Um, let me call on her next. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just had a few comments. Uh, first, I think the committee has performed a useful function for our democracy uh, by suggesting ways to systematically improve the way Congress functions. And that we've done that in a collaborative fashion, in a bipartisan fashion makes it even better. Um, I would just also like to thank our staff. The staff of the House Administration Committee and the Modernization Committee have worked together very collaboratively. It's really been seamless. Uh, throughout this process. And as uh, the chair and the committee know, 
as we have made recommendations in the Modernization Committee, uh, we've been able to implement them. We haven't waited for a final report. We've gone ahead to implement many of the recommendations. In fact, some of them were in the works as the Modernization Committee was looking at them. Uh, obviously, the House Administration Committee is the, has the primary jurisdiction over the operations of the House, but it's not the only committee that could have uh, jurisdiction over some of the things uh, that we're looking at. Obviously, the Budget Committee uh, uh, comes to mind. That's a, a very large challenge to see how that might be improved, as well as the Appropriations Committee, where uh, the member, uh, the chairman serves. Uh, I'd just like to say that I'm eager to work with you and all the members to make sure that the promising work that we have uh, achieved this year doesn't get lost, uh, and that we continue an effort, whether it's either in the House Administration Committee or some other format. Obviously, we need to have a discussion, not only on this committee, but in the broader body, about what is the best way to proceed, but it's valuable. And I think uh, the leadership shown by yourself and the ranking member really stands out as helping the whole committee be successful. And with that, I don't have additional questions, Mr. Chairman, but I do thank you for recognizing me and for the service that you have provided uh, along with all of the other members. I yield back. Thank you, Chair Lofgren. Um, next up, Ms. Van Dyne. Okay. Go for it, Ms. Williams. Okay, Thanks. Thank you. See how cooperative we are in this committee? <laughs> Um, good morning, everyone. And Ms. Spender, I know that Mr. Timmons is probably going to talk with you a lot about this um, when he gets to his questions. But this calendar that you talked about rolling out, the digitized calendar that could deconflict the schedules of Congress, like right now, I have a financial services full committee hearing that I'm sure my chairwoman will, is wondering where, why I'm not there as well. But we also had this committee hearing, and it never fails every week that we have committee hearings. I either have this hearing along with TNI or this hearing along with financial services. So it was music to my ears reading your remarks and seeing that there was a plan to roll out um, a calendar that could deconflict some of the committee schedules. And I'm just wondering what that rollout looks like and what is the timeline for something like that? Well, I, I will tell you, it's on our, it's on our, one of our to-do lists to do. Our digital service group, which is taking that over to, to develop, is looking into it, but they have, don't have their project plan together or what they think is going to be the way in which they will do that. The digital service team um, was kicked off in February and we've spent a number of months pulling together a team that can concentrate on having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with those individuals who are interested in that particular initiative, along with a number of others that they have, uh, they're looking into. So I can certainly provide updates on an ongoing basis. We are excited about it. It is something that Mr. So Davis- am I. Mr. Davis brought up to me uh, some time ago, and um, we think there's an opportunity. We're using some new uh, development tools and code bases that we believe will make this much easier to do. And um, so, really looking into um, what this means, and they're going to need to work with the clerk's organization as well. So it gives us a chance to work with them to be able to get some of the information and everything that they need. And we have a very good working relationship with them. So so we're not quite at a rollout phase yet, is what well, I'm hearing. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could say we were, but we're in the early stages of coming together with what that's going to look like, how it's going to work, and then we're using agile process processes, which allows you to go in and start some early development on it and do some small steps to get something up and working, have individuals working with your staff and others to get individuals to look at what we're doing 
and then develop it. But we will get you a schedule as soon as we have one that is, is prepared. We are prepared to tell you about it. But it is one of the ones that we are moving forward with. Thank you. I'm going to call on Ms. Van Dyne next, but I, I, I do know, I think it was the Bipartisan Policy Center had just sort of a draft example of what a what block scheduling could look like. Mm -hmm. I don't think that deconflicts everything if you go that direction. And, sorry, and inevitably some committees will balk at being told when they can and can't do their hearings. But I think it'd be better, right? I think it's a start. Yeah. Um, because right now everything conflicts with everything. So, yeah. you know, as... as uh, your office looks into that. I, I commend you to look at that just as a starting point. Uh, Ms. Van Dyne. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the fact that you have freshmen on this committee um, because we really kind of get thrown, you know, the, I don't want to say the leftovers because that sounds really bad, but you know what I mean. <laughs> sort of. When we have the number of committees that we're on, the number of subcommittees, because you know, very few of us are on a committee, so we are on multiple committees select committees, caucuses, how many committees are there? And then how many subcommittees are there? I'm asking you because I have no clue. I mean, we've, we've, we've counted, but there seems to be ones that we don't know about. Do we have like an official number of committees and subcommittees? I am sure there's an official number. I, I don't know. I've, I look through uh, the CAO um, website all the time and uh, our uh, house.gov and looking at all the, the the listing of all the committees and everything. But with the subcommittees, I, I, I can't tell you. That's how far off we are from actually <laughs> rolling this out. I mean, I look at it from a college perspective and, you know, if, if we can have colleges that have you know, tens of thousands of students and probably equal number of classes to be able to figure out so there's not overlap, we should be able to do it in Congress. Um, not only, I think, are we, are we fighting with scheduling, but orientation, I think, is also really important. We're somewhat fresh off of that. I know it's been a year and a half, but we've got another class that's going to be coming. Um, we came in in a unique year. It was COVID. We were separated. Everybody wore masks. We didn't have events. But we also were separated from the beginning. You know, you had your Republican orientation. You had your um, Democrat orientation. It would have been nice if, I think, if we could have actually have met um, all members that were coming in and there are all of our class and have done events together. I think that would have been really great. Your point on not having bills and, and being rank and file and not knowing what we're voting on, it's not just rank and file. Um, a lot of times we're not getting bills until um, literally hours before we're expected to vote on them. Um, and there are multiple hundred pages bills. Um, I don't think a business could definitely not work that way. A government should absolutely not work that way. Um, you're going to have fights with leadership on that because a lot of times they're adding details up until the very moment that they come out. Um, how we can fix that, I don't know. I know that we have tried to have fixes in the past, you know, 24-hour, 48-hour, 72-hour mark, but it takes a very small handful to be able to kind of override those rules. So having potentially not just um, suggestions or ideas, but hard, fast rules that we can count on, um, regardless of what party that you are in or majority or minority would be very helpful. I've got a question on CAO. How many resumes are we getting? Have you seen a decrease in the number of resumes over the last, over the last couple of years, or have you seen an increase? How is that working? Uh, for, uh, for staff, staff. for, for cap, Capitol Hill staff. Um, well, you know, we have just started the resume bank that would allow staffers and anyone interested in a staff position to be sent to us to be added or added to the resume bank. And within the CAO, most of all of our uh, recruiting is within the CAO and for the Sergeant Farms, we assist our HR department and also for the clerk if they need any assistance. But I, I really, I know for the CAO, the number of uh, resumes we get in, but for the member offices, I, I could not tell you. Uh, I can and, and I'm tell asking you that question because from across the board and pretty much every single sector, 
labor shortages have been an issue. On talking with my colleagues, it hasn't been an issue getting resumes into the office. So to your point that you know you have to pay more and you can you know keep people, the fact is, is that we will never, nor should we ever strive to compete with the private sector on pay. Mm -hmm. I think what we are able to give an experience and on being a market differentiator on a resume is incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at everything as being how much are you paying, um, I think we start running into problems. But have my colleagues have problems with people applying for positions in their office? District, without a doubt. But I mean on, on, on Capitol Hill. When we started the Resume Bank, which was our opportunity to give the member offices a chance to review resumes of people who may be interested in staff positions within the offices, within the first week, we had over 2,000 submitted. Yeah. And I know that subsequent weeks, we got more thousands of resumes. So. We hope that that is at least an opportunity for people to provide resumes that they can go through, have access to the resume bank, and, and look at to see if there's someone there that would be a really good candidate for their office. All right, thank you very much. Scheduling conflicts, I know Mr. Cleaver's in a markup right now, so I'm gonna call on him next. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, uh, financial services, homeland security, and uh, modernization right now. I left homeland uh, security, which is one floor up, to run down here and gave them my, uh, gave, uh, some of the staff members my, my uh, phone number so they could text me uh, when they need me to come upstairs for a vote. Uh, and I think that's absolutely embarrassing for the United States of America to have a political body uh, where all of the committees can literally be scheduled, committee hearings can be literally scheduled at the same time. Uh, and, and so I, I, um, I, I want to add my comments uh, with those that were made earlier. Uh, but the college um, analogy made may, may make some sense. Uh, well, it does make sense. I don't mean, it shouldn't say it makes sense. It may make, uh, but but the difference because in the in the college system, you you uh, enroll, uh, and the, and you go there to make sure that you don't enroll in two classes that meet at the same time, and maybe uh, it's going to take a lot more time. But maybe that's what we need to do. I mean, d during a certain period of time, we ought to. I mean, the, the leadership uh, and the bodies that make the recommendations on which committee we sit on. I mean, maybe that needs to be done early, early on, like the first couple of days when we're here. Because, uh, you know, we just accept the fact. And I think it's bad for our image. Because people, for example, they see Rodney Davis leaving. And, and, and well, <laughs> but, 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 I mean, uh, they could, I mean, somebody in the public well, he just doesn't want to be here at the meeting, and he's leaving. Uh, you know, or when or when we leave. I mean, uh, I have to leave early. You know, uh, people watching C-SPAN or uh, in, in the com committee hearing room, they, they don't know. Uh, they don't know how dumb this joint is. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I I think one of the things we can we need to flirt with 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 the brain power like you have, and uh, in, in the history, you know, it, it's. There ought to be some kind of period when we first get here uh, at the beginning of each session where we enroll or, I mean, you can figure it out. I don't, I, you know, I can't do that part. I, I, but I do know, know that, that that part needs to be done. Uh, and and my, well, my final comment, I hate uh, Rodney, uh, Mr. Davis left, uh, because I, 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 I think we, we, it may have been luck, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Timmons, it may have been luck they put a group of people on, on here who actually uh, want to make the place run better and smoothly. And, and who, uh, I mean, I don't know if we could have gotten better than Grays or Timmons, uh, you know, as uh, vice chairs. Uh, and I've said to the chairman uh, publicly and behind his back that I thought uh, this has been amazing. And 
and I, I am I'm upset even that uh, Mr. Perlmutter is leaving. Um, but I, mean, I can get over that, but uh, it's the, the other parts of this, this are, are really troublesome. So um, anyway, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll go back to home then. Mr. Cleaver, <laughs> and for those watching on C-SPAN, when Mr. Cleaver leaves, it's not that he doesn't care about the work of our committee. It's <laughs> that he has to go vote in Homeland Security. So I hope you're watching and understanding. Uh, I know Mr. Vice Chair Timmons wants to weigh in here. Before and then I got Mr. Mr. Cleaver leaves, I want to point something out real quick. Um, he has three hearings right now because it is likely that we will not be here on Friday. And because of that, that makes tomorrow the flyout day. We flew in last night. We got here at 6.30. Um, we very well could be leaving tomorrow. Who knows? Might, might not. But the committees know that. So they're scheduling everything right now. Um, I always talk about the 2019 calendar. We were here for 65 full days and 66 travel days. 65 full days over 32 weeks. So an average of two days a week. When you're here two days a week and you might be losing a day because something happens on the calendar and flyouts early, you're just gonna have conflict. So while we are thinking about the calendar and the schedule and deconflicting everything, having, a, having more days here and having a more predictable schedule as far as when we're here is a very important part, uh, if not the most important part of the equation. I have more thoughts on everything else, but I'll yield back. Uh, Mr. Phillips, and then I got Mr. Perlmutter on the on deck. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, it only takes a few days of joining this institution to recognize that there's a distinct bias against both cooperation uh, and improvement. And uh, I will offer that I believe that is not just a competitive risk to the United States of America, but uh, a national security risk. And that's why I believe that this, this group, this work that we're doing is the most important work in the United States Congress. Uh, I believe this committee is the most important. And frankly, it saddens me that it's somewhat of a metaphor for what's going on more broadly in our country and around the world, and that the most important work is ignored or dismissed, underappreciated, uh, and some of the most trivial, unimportant, is elevated uh, in inappropriate ways. And I just want to celebrate both our chairs, uh, my colleagues, uh, the staff of this extraordinary committee, and our individual staffs who have made this possible and have actually made some meaningful change in an institution that uh, surely needs it and frankly has restored some of my own faith in the U.S. Congress and our country. And I want to celebrate all of us for a minute. Uh, that's my thank you. Uh, my proposition uh, is to somehow encourage us to work together and make some propositions for the next House Rules Package. You know, some of this can go through regular order, but we know how complicated that is. And we also know there's an absence of regular order in this institution. I would argue that we should put together some recommendations to whomever might lead the House in the next session of Congress uh, and actually uh, revise our House rules to implement some of these and try to embed a culture of modernization. And I say that as someone who has great appreciation for conserving the conservation of what works and progressing on the issues uh, and areas that we can do better. Uh, and I think that starts with changing the House rules package. I also encourage all of us to speak with leadership on both sides of the aisle to ensure that we elevate the very people uh, that are mindful and bring that ethos to the institution. Um, because without leadership, I don't think any of this will become successful. Uh, but my question uh, uh, to you, doctor, and to you, Ms. Hill, uh, is just a simple one. If you could wave a magic wand, you both, <clears throat> both made recommendations, but if you could wave a magic wand based on this conversation and your own recommendations, uh, what is your most important of all your propositions, especially you, Ms. Hill, with, with a variety of them, what do you think we should do singularly uh, to take the next step? I'll start with you, doctor. I've wanted that wand for a long time. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> Me too. Your, your lead up is exactly where I'd start. And in this discussion about how this committee can continue in whatever format it could is important. And there's, there's pros and cons to each. Um, House rules package is, is the ticket. I mean, it's a singular vote at the beginning of Congress that not many people pay attention to, which for, for a lot of you, 
uh, is an opportunity, and you can make serious institutional lasting substantive changes with a singular vote at the beginning of a Congress. That is super important and a very attractive vehicle for, for this committee in particular. Um, and so going back to, to the, the idea of House administration, I get the logic of, of using that as the most um, logical place for, for these recommendations. I urge you to think about, though, um, the, the substantive changes that you'll be limited in putting it in a place like that, um, including the, the things that you are frustrated with um, on, on a leadership centralization basis, right? So um, the downsides of House admin is that you're still subject to the, the limitations and leadership prerogatives that it is. The access to the floor will be completely limited the same way it is on a lot of your other subcommittees and committees. Um, and so it, it, to me, it seems like the House administration idea is to implement what has already been recommended. Great place for it. That's obviously where the jurisdiction lies. It makes sense they're gonna be a turf war for it anyway. That's implementation of already passed recommendations. For the big, substantive, calendar specific, all of the things that you, the non low hanging fruit to Mr. Davis's point, those big institutional changes, I'm a huge fan of using the rules package to create something bigger. Um, and again, that the lack of attention to something like that in a rules package that big, I think it's an opportunity that not many people take advantage of. There's a way that you can set this up, probably in the mold of something like the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, mm -hmm. where you create this independence, right? right? And that's the key point. Funding independence, staff independent, procedural independence that you won't get in a, in a typical standing subcommittee. They just won't be available to you. So the magic wand there opens up just the opportunity for institutional change. And then it comes down to members. It just does. And it always will in an institution like this. A lot of these things are member-led decisions. The idea that Chairman Kilmer can take a step back and recognize someone four seats down, not only of the Republican Party, of the minority party, that's a decision. That's, you can't write that into House rules. You can't write that into procedure. You can't legislate behavior. There's leadership by example that is all too often forgotten and just simple, small things, something he remembered and pointed out, that the feedback loop of that is, is infinite. So rules package is my magic wand. I think it opens the most opportunity for big institutional change, not to discount the recommendations that have already been made. There's plenty more left to do. Mm -hmm. That's the best place to do it. Thank you, Doctor. Ms. Hill. I have to say that I'm grateful that Dr. Burgat is a member of the cohort, that I'm the coordinator of it, because he certainly has the expertise and the issues that I don't have. If I had a magic wand, what I would do is I would start with that, probably the last point that he would make. I would renew this select committee, mm -hmm. and I would renew it with the spirit uh, which it started with four years ago to provide the energy, the drive, to take all the things that have been done so far now um, have the recommendations be implemented. I would give the select committee more teeth, and I would um, I would open the ears of the Senate. Quite honestly, mm -hmm. you know the 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 work that we have to do over there for modernization of the whole Congress and the difference that we could make um, if both chambers could work together um, would go a long ways. I think in in renewing uh, Congress and, and giving us a stronger footing. Um, I don't pretend to be an expert on all of the rules. Uh, my, my goal is bringing people together, but I do know this. People matter and how they behave matter. And this committee works well in part. What a treat to see all the members here today, everyone working together. Um, Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, you both bring such a strong leadership to this effort and you open the door across committees. We need to see more of that. And we if we could have a committee that exactly kind of modeled and continue to model this behavior. One of the reasons that that is so important is that committees don't have that option now. They don't see that model. They don't have anywhere else to go to know that it works. Um, you can see from my bio that I started um, on the, years ago, right, in the 80s, I was on the Hill. I started in 1989 with Congresswoman Boggs. Um, so from that time, she would not allow us to have computers. We had electronic typewriters mm -hmm. until today when we're looking at how we can live stream um, events and town hall meetings. I incredible difference. Uh, we need some members that can lean into that, love it, and embrace it in the way that you do. Thank you. And, and as a freshman in 2019, uh, when I was handed a pager, <laughs> 
I kept that on my credenza as a nice metaphor, and I no longer have it, so we're making progress. I want to thank you, and let me just close by thanking our chairs and our staff and my colleagues again, because it's not just the work that we're doing, but I think most importantly, it's how we're doing it. And that starts with leadership, and I'm grateful to all of you. Thank you. Can I, I, I want to call on Mr. Perlmutter, but before I do, you said add more teeth. Um, can you just double click on that real quick before I call on Mr. Perlmutter? Yes. Um, I think one of the things that you've done admirably and, and worked so hard on is uh, rolling out recommendations to have them available and then implementing them. If this uh, select committee had more teeth and a, a stronger way to, to do some of the implementation in the jurisdiction, I'm thinking of some kind of mechanism. I listened to um, Ms. Spencer talk about needing strong direction in terms of, of what they can accomplish at the CAO's office. And the strong direction can come from select committee working hand in hand with the Committee on House Administration if there's a mechanism built in to help do that. Um, and I think the energy to make the change has come from the select committee. That's been my view, right? because I know the excellent professional staff on House Administration and the members, um, it's not that they don't want to make change, it's that sometimes other issues that are they're having to deal with overshadow that. So if there's a way to influx those two, I would, I would think that would be a really good idea. Thanks, Mr. Perlman. None. Nope. Um, First, I want to thank uh, the committee and uh, you, Derek, for allowing us to um, visit uh, the European Union and Parliament last week. Uh, Mr. Timmons, Mr. Desaunier, and I uh, had a fantastic trip that I think uh, will uh, bring a lot of fruit to bear uh, in terms of suggestions that we, we had um, and have about modernizing and improving the way this place functions by looking at other contrasting uh, parliaments and legislative bodies. And, you know, legislature is, a, there's a tension uh, between sort of norms and traditions that you have from the beginning of time. And we met with parliament, which basically is from the beginning of time. Then there's, our, then we sort of come into existence, the EU much later, uh, sort of on the spectrum. And we learned a lot. And what we learned um, was that we're not doing things too badly, but we can do a lot better uh, by taking some of their ideas and suggestions. And both, to your point, doctor, uh, the rules package is the place you start. Probably in 2020, for me, the three most important votes I've ever taken in my career, and I've been doing this 28 years now between the state legislature and uh, Congress, was the election of the speaker, the passage of the rule package, and the certification of the presidential election. Those are the three votes I've taken out of thousands of votes that I consider to be the most important votes. But that rule package piece of this thing is key to how we manage our affairs, at least for two years coming. As you said, administration has to implement it, but the rules package re really can establish where you're going with it. And luckily... We had the vice chair sort of leading this trip. We had a member of the Rules Committee, and we had staff from the uh, House administrations to be able to really look to what things can be done. And so, you know, this committee has been looking really in four areas, technology, personnel, campus, and member kind of relationships and how we relate to the institution. Because I, I agree with Mr. Phillips and I disagree, uh, I agree with Ms. Van Dyne on a lot of things, but I disagree with her on a couple things. We need to make sure that this house is as equal to the other branches of government, if not more equal, and to the private sector and to other countries. That we don't need to just hamstring ourselves for whatever reason. And I, and one of, one other place I disagree, and then I want to talk about one recommendation. I've got, I gave you 14 from my, from my trip. Uh, but one other place I disagree with her, and I would, I, I, 
think that it is very important that as a body, that we are competitive with the private sector. That just because I can go hire somebody doesn't mean that they provide services to the community that need to be done. And people learn that. If you were working for Lindy Boggs in 1989, you start off, you don't know anything. But you were there, you hired, but then you learn. And, th and then if you stay, you provide good services to the people that you represent. So I think retention is key. And we have, and I, I want to thank the vice chair here because he and you, Ms. Spindor, have been so focused on making sure that we have good personnel and good staff and we retain good staff. Last thing I'll say where I do agree, uh, and it was uh, Beth Van Dyne that sort of, uh, along with uh, Aubrey from uh, House Admin, that gave me an idea about orientation. All right, so one of the things that we're talking about that you talked about, Doctor, is rank and file members, we feel a little disenfranchised or uh, we've lost, we, we want to be more empowered. You know, that the individual member wants to be more empowered. We have some ideas about that. But one of the places, as a freshman coming in, you've just won an election. You've got a million things going on, people coming at you from all directions. And you go to orientation, and even if they, we'd had a joint orientation, it lasts for three days, and you don't know half the questions to ask. So then you split into the parties. You don't operate really as a class again, you know, other than that three-day orientation or two days or whatever it is. The suggestion that I'm going to make um, that I think is a good one is that later on, maybe nine months out or a year out, as a freshman class has gotten their feet under them and start having an idea of the questions to ask, that there be a second kind of orientation where... Again, it sort of builds across the party lines kind of a class identity, as well as being able to ask, answer questions. You know, you didn't know what questions to ask in the first place. Now you've got a better idea. And that came from, from Beth, from Aubrey, but then also the woman who runs the House of Commons, that they suffered uh, under COVID just as we did, and their new members coming in couldn't really be uh, oriented uh, in a way that uh, allowed them to really understand when votes were going to be and all that. So we've made improvements, I think, a lot on the technology side. We've got a lot more to do. We've made a lot of improvements on personnel. Dean should have been on this trip because he could have seen some changes to the campus that would have made things more member and user friendly uh, that uh, these other part that the parliament and, and EU had. The member, colleague, scheduling thing, all of that, and empowering members, I'm going to leave that to smarter people than me. And I want to just thank you, Derek, for allowing me to be part of this committee. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for all you contribute to our committee. Um, Vice Chair Timmons. Hey, Mr. Chairman. I will point out Vice Chair Timmons is going to hit all the questions that I want to ask you, too, um, or most of them. So. He said we've been working together too long, too long. Um, and I'm not leaving just because of you. Oh, sure you're not. We spent too much time together last week, so he's probably sick and tired of me. Um, so while I would, I'm not even sure if I would. I, I can see arguments to try to extend the select committee, um, but I think we were extremely fortunate to get four years. We were only supposed to get 12 months, which was really only like eight months, given the fact that between the calendar and we didn't really get up and running until March. So, um, you know, I, I think we've made a lot of great recommendations. We've made a lot of progress. So I do think that there's a lot of consensus around the subcommittee on House Administration. And I do, I'm not sure there's consensus on this idea. I'm going to run through a couple of things and ask for your feedback. Um, I, you know, right now there's only one Republican on each of the subcommittees. And, you know, I don't think that this subcommittee should have uh, 
disparate numbers. I think if it's two Republicans, two Democrats, three Republicans, three Democrats, I think that would be good. It, it will ultimately be focused on implementation of previous recommendations from the, the select committee, preparation for the next select committee, and um, it would work closely with partners, cohort, and, and thus and such. So, I mean, the question then becomes, how often do we need a select committee? I think everybody agrees it's not every 30 years. Um, so then is it every three, is it every four, is it every five Congresses? Um, you know, I'm not sure the answer for that, but I think we can probably find some consensus for it. And I, I think the beauty of this structure, the subcommittee would be focusing on implementation and on preparation. So when the next select committee comes around, we hit the ground running. The, the select committee is just ready to go. Most of the staff is already hired. There's already been uh, a lot of pseudo here. I'm not sure if you'd call it a hearing, but I mean, they're, they're readying material for the select committee. And so it could ideally operate within two years and, and get it done. This is another weird idea. Um, space shows value. So, I mean, if this is something we're serious about, I think it should have its own office space and it should, it should go from a subcommittee to the select committee and it could just be its own space. And we could actually maybe get a round table in the EU and the UK. Literally, everybody is, is well, the EU had round tables and the UK had a much better setup than this. Um, that was a much more productive uh, setup. But again, I mean, if this is something that is important, I think it is. I think finding a way to create um, continuity is, is has value. Um, yeah, I really do think that having that set up going from a subcommittee to a select committee back and forth um, with three or four or five congresses in between would allow the planning to occur prior to the select committee to so the select committee can really just hit the ground running and, and maximize its use of time. So I'll just put that back to y'all. What thoughts do you have on, on all of that? What do you think? I think you have some very good ideas about that. Um, from my perspective, I just want to make sure that for my myself and my staff, we are were able to work through however this committee will evolve to be able to do our job based on what you're asking us, understanding what you ask us having the ability to sit down and talk with you about options, about how we're going to move forward with things. That is what is a need that my department has. So however it's structured, as long, whether it's going through the House Committee on Administration to someone or some other way, we have to be able to sit down and have constructive conversations with whomever is making recommendations and whoever is going to help us prioritize the work that we do, or at least review our suggestions for prioritization, because we do a lot of the prioritization ourselves. We have been traditionally sitting down with both sides of the House Committee on Administration after talking to you and reviewing those initiatives that we're going to be moving forward with. So we, we just need the assistance and the information. And I, I do agree that uh, to make it a, 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 a full recommendation that we can understand, having the bipartisan perspectives of having enough of the bipartisan individuals providing us information from a data gathering perspective and planning of our projects, it's extremely beneficial. So, thank you. Dr. Bergat. As with almost everything here, I think it's important to start to answer your question with a question of, depends on what your goals are. What are your goals for this select committee? Um, historically, um, there's been several types from minimally successful to overwhelmingly successful. And their goals differed from the outset, and I think that's important. 
your, your point about the membership being important, particularly on the minority side, just to have one minority represent, representative on the subcommittee, you can imagine, let alone if they're not even present, um, how, how overrun they could be. But even then, you're still subject to the full committee's limitations and access to the floor and things like that. It will still be uh, limiting uh, what, what you can do. Um, in terms of the question of how often a select committee or some version of this committee is, is necessary, um, I think it's important to point out that this committee started um, kind of behind the eight ball in a couple different ways. Um, it had been a long time since the previous one, and that previous one was one of those minimally successful ones, right? So you had a, a bunch of legwork to do to catch up to what that, that had been missing then. And then just the time period, the subject of the time period since that previous select committee and now has been the most biggest change we've ever seen across almost every single variable you can think of, technology included. So you had more to do because more had changed. And that pace of change isn't slowing down anytime soon either. So to, to try to systematize in five Congresses from now, those each period of, of, of those five Congresses, those 10-year periods are not going to be equal. It's going, you're going to basically trying to fix what the last committee left behind and try to make up for. So if your goal is to proactively change the institution, it's got to be permanent. If your goal is to retroactively change what went wrong or what was left over, then the, the systematized every so often can, can serve that purpose. Um, just as you mentioned the space equals value, that's absolutely true, from parking spaces to, to committee room space. So does permanence. So does permanence. It sets a tone. It sets a message. It sends a message that this is not um, intervally important to us, that we can just wait for the next one. I think we're at a point now with some of the most important institutional questions in a way that we haven't been in a long, long time, that permanence speaks to the moment of now. Um, that only then can you start to talk about the, 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 the non-low-hanging fruit, the, the civility, the ones that are tearing us out at our seams, the permanence of, of a committee like that, to say nothing of the independence that you can set up to, to make those, those changes, the teeth that you talk about, access to the floor, permanence in, in stature, that we don't just have to wait you out or wait your recommendations out, um, your independent funding streams, your permanent office space, all of those speak to the importance of the moment, and I think there's no more important moment than now to get at the, the kinds of questions that I think you all are trying to get at. I would agree with Dr. Burgott, again. Um, no surprise on that. And what I've heard from you today, from members here, um, is that uh, just modernization, as a matter of course over time, waiting for extended periods isn't an option, yeah. right? That's one thing. And that this is the most important work going on in Congress today, making sure that every, you are up to date, you are modernized, you've got the best staff, it, it will lead everything else. My organization, the Partnership for Public Service, our, um, our genesis and the reason we came about was to help the executive branch. The reason that we're here today is because we understand how vitally important Congress is to making the executive branch healthy. Um, and that's why I've spent the last four years at the partnership working on this very issue. I don't think, um, and I speak for myself, uh, I, I have not put this question out to the cohort or received any kind of how often it should be, um, but if you think it's a periodic time, every two years, every four years, I can see a cycle, Vice Chair Timmons, um, where we now have almost 200 recommendations, right? So to take, and, and that's why we I framed my testimony in the way that, that I did. Um, to take the next two years and put a primary focus on implementing those recommendations makes a good deal of sense. But in that time frame, you need to still be looking at what needs to be changed next. If we look at all the changes that can occur in a two-year period, and you guys have worked through the most difficult of those times, there is just so much more coming at us today than ever before, I think we need to be prepared for the change. So I think we, we might cycle in that way to implement for a couple of years while still looking um, at possible modernization ways, things that we need to do, and then two years after that, we go hard at making new recommendations and how to implement them. I think there's a country song 
uh, that uses the lyric, how can I miss you when you won't go away? Um, and uh, I'm, I'm conscious that there's a little bit of that dynamic with this committee and that it was established for a year and then here we still are. Uh, if you had asked me prior to this hearing sort of what I would do, I think I would set up a subcommittee on house admin. I haven't checked with the leaders of house admin about how they feel about that yet, but um, that's probably what I would do. And I would probably make it equal members and have them focus on implementation. And I would probably have our committee make a recommendation in that regard. And I would probably have us make a recommendation to say every three or four Congresses, there ought to be something established to look at ongoing uh, institutional improvement. I think I make a decent point for just keeping it rolling. Having said that though, you know, I, I think it, it, it begs the question other than focusing on implementation, which is probably where House Admin and House Rules, the bulk of the work is gonna happen through them. What other, you know, Dr. Berga, you said your, your um, students want us to focus on how do you empower rank and file members. I, I would argue some of the recommendations we've made have been in that spirit. But, so let me ask you, you know, if you were setting the work plan for a select committee that got renewed next Congress, what would you have it work on? Yeah. Incentivizing legislating, o almost, and with legislating, incentivizing bipartisan oversight. Mm -hmm. um, the problem there is, is that now you're involving incentive structures fully outside the chamber, right? Yeah. From how elections are, are run to how districts are drawn to the types of members that you're gonna get here, including this next freshman class, there's going to be ones that ran diametrically opposed to the institution, and one because of it. And not only are you going to be trying to welcome them into the conversation, they're going to be incentivized to stay out of it. That's impossible, that is sin sincerely impossible, and better you than me to try to, 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 to help with that. Um, but in terms of getting the ones, not everyone's like that, not everyone's the flamethrower, and I think that you, in conversations, you can, you can kind of discern who's, who has some sort of issue um, that they want to, to get advanced. The problem is, is that if they are told from the day they get here that access is only through a very few types of, of, of ways to get implemented, your legislative text, not every member cares about every bill, nor should they, but there should be a reasonable path, including on the minority side, a reasonable path that you know that your work will pay off. Um, it may not include a, a law being passed, but just a vote, just a markup, just a debate, just an amendment. Those are ways that you will think twice about burning the bridge that you might have otherwise done. And I think that the, anything that you uh, can do to incentivize that through rules, through and it's always committees, always has been committees, and it always starts with the, the chair and ranking member setting those standards. Offering those paths to legislative productivity is, is the be all end all for me. Ms. Hill. Am I on now? Thank you, you for your question. Um, I think one of the things that I would look at, I would look at, um, continue to look at the staffing issues that we're currently looking at. Mm -hmm. As I was listening to Dr. Burgott's testimony, I think those students that are in his classes that want those changes are our future, right? And they're not just our future as staffers and staffing, but they're our future as members. And when they um, enter that in the institution, as we know is gonna have to happen, right? Demographics are on their side. Um, what we, we need to be prepared for that. And those are some of the issues that we need to be considering. How, how do we make sure that as members enter, um, they're prepared to serve their constituents. They're prepared to reach out in the ways that they need to be able to do that, right? And, and again, I think one of the recommendations I would urge you to make is that we do um, begin to have talks with the Senate, not even begin, but for, for a joint select committee um, so that we know and send a signal to our friends in the other chamber we need to do something here. So I think the work is still yet to be done um, I, I, too, Chair Kilmer, agree with you about the Committee on House Administration may be a very good place to be doing that now. Um, and I, I have to say that I, 
I speak for myself individually um, because it seems like the timing is right. My fear in that is that we don't come back to these serious modernization issues in, in a real manner quickly. How would you, would you do every three Congresses? You would make it I would it do either other, every other. Okay. Do you agree with that? I'm fine with that. I think you can set the, the floor, a minimum of every X number, and then as ne That's necessary the conditions arise, jump to it, and necessary conditions arise. Yeah. It's funny. The, I've thought a lot about this, right? And Chris from Roll Call, thank you for being here. The, um, he asked, you know, so what did, what did the committee not take up that you wish it had? And so I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And a lot of it's either things outside of our jurisdiction or things where it's tricky to get two-thirds vote, right? I mean, if you ask me some of the things that are broken in Congress, I would say, you know, the role of money, the uh, way district boundaries are drawn, and the way members are selected through primaries probably drive a lot of the kind of conflict entrepreneurship that you see within the institution. I'm not sure a select committee now, next year, or in the future is likely to take up those issues. I'd probably argue cable news and social media also contribute. I don't even know where to start on that, and I'm not certain it's something that um, a committee like this could work on, but maybe it could. I don't know. Um, it's certainly something I've, uh, I've been chewing on as this, you know, at least as, as we sprint to the last four months of this. Um, I, I actually also think the one of the things that makes tricky this issue around schedule is the difference between where we are and um, where a college is. People are already enrolled in their class, right? You've got members who are already on committee. And so deconflicting, if even the challenge of block scheduling is, you might ask, you're either putting someone in the position of having conflict or having to give something up. Nobody wants to give something up when they've accrued seniority. And so that, that does make it a little bit tricky. Um, I think we could deconflict it more than it is right now. And so I'm really pleased to hear that the CAO is working on that. I think we need some help. And the sooner the better, because as we roll into the next Congress, we're just going to have the exact same dynamic as you saw in this committee where members are in three hearings at the same time. So I think that's really important. I also, um, Ms. Binder, I, I wanted to get at just getting a sense of how you and your office tracks implementation of the recommendations that fall under your jurisdiction. You know, do you kind of have a checklist that you work off of or is it more ad hoc based on what members of your team have sort of prioritized and front burnered um, and give us direction. I mean, I actually think we, I'm, I'm going to make a statement and you may disagree with it. Like, I think we got better at working with your office over time, just trying to vet things in terms of, okay, here's what we're actually thinking about. How could we word this in a way that's more implementable, but give us some direction as we make recommendations to future reform efforts. How might we best work with you on implementation going forward? Well, the answer is yes, I have many lists. <laughs> but, and those of my staff that are watching know, uh, I, uh, I am a very old project manager from many days back, and I uh, believe in planning and then executing the plan and having the expectations that you meet so we do have a list. We, we use a product called ClickUp to track our projects. And we have regular meetings on a monthly basis where I sit down with my staff and others to review the projects and the status of the projects that we have. The modernization initiatives that we're working on are part of that. I ask questions about where we are. It tracks, this tool tracks the, the um, any issues that we're finding with that particular initiative. It tracks who the primary support person is for that initiative. So I'm, it's built into me to have um, tools that I can use to understand at any point in time where an initiative may not be doing too well. And maybe we need to talk about it. Maybe we need to add additional resources. Maybe we need to look at what, we're, what the funds are that we're actually allowing that individual to use to bring in some additional help. So I have, we have a list. 
it's maintained, it's reviewed. It is the list that I review with the chiefs of staff and other members of the CHA. So um, we, we have all of your projects that you have requested that I've talked about in my testimony uh, listed there. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Sure. Um, we're a weird committee, so sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're trying to be yeah. more informal here. But um, I, I'm, I'm listening to a lot of the things about the timing and um, how often some type of committee in some form should meet and everything. Being in technology, I know how rapidly everything changes. And I, I just want to make sure that, and it's things, nobody, we all know how things have changed in the past couple of years, okay? So um, how do we really maintain this momentum? I mean, we've got all of these initiatives that you all have brilliantly come up with and we were working with you on, but it could be tomorrow next week or next month, that something significant could come up that would require us to focus on that mm -hmm. and maybe have to push some of these things to the background. So, I, you know, it's almost like every month there's something else coming out. So how do we stay current, I think, is the question I'm asking given the rapid change in our environment, in technology, in staffing, in everything going yeah. on in this world, without there being some consistency along the road if we're looking at extending anything with this committee? I think each of you testified to the value of having these topics sit somewhere permanently, right? And I think a subcommittee on house admin, particularly in terms of the engagement with your office, is probably a good place to do it. I, again, say that without having talked to Chair Lofgren about that, but <laughs> I have talked to uh, Ranking Member Davis of the house admin committee. I think he thinks that's a good idea. Has been pretty vocal about that. But I, 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 I do think there's um, value in having some subcommittee or committee going to bed every night thinking about. How are we working on implementation and waking up every morning focused on, on implementation? I, I also take to heart the comments that have made about you know, the, the need to continue engaging on these issues as, as issues come up. I just, my sense is, particularly since this, um, this select committee was extended to four times the length it was initially um, in, envisioned, uh, I'm just not sure it's like a likely outcome that it be made permanent. And so to me, the next best thing is our committee making a recommendation to say no more than, you know, or, 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 or no less frequently than every three or four Congresses. The other thing I've thought about, and I, I don't know, Ms. Hill, um, I'm actually kind of curious what the future of the cohort looks like, um, particularly if this committee expires. You know, one thought that I've had also, we haven't talked about this, but. Again, we're informal. Um, you could establish a fixed Congress caucus, right? And so people will self-select. Getting back to the people proposition, it's a lot easier to engage on these issues with people who actually want to improve the institution. So you could set up something, you know, there's caucuses dealing with all sorts of issues. In the interim between the expiration of this committee and a new committee popping up, you could do that. Now, the challenge is, you know, that's only as good as the members of a caucus are committed to the work of the caucus, right? So you almost want to make sure that there's, you either want to staff it, you know, you either, either want to have members actually put some dough up to hire uh, uh, someone to run the show or dedicate a certain amount of their staff time to, to the work of that. I don't know, I don't know your reaction to that. And again, I am curious, if we set up something like that, does that make more likely the continued engagement of the cohort? I think, uh, let me just take a step back for a minute because the cohort is an interesting mix mm -hmm. of, of the 45 organizations. There are some 
um, who can lobby. There are some who can't. So um, some of those who can't provide, I just, I want to give you this background. Some of those who can't provide expertise and guidance and they um, feel very strongly that it's, and we all do, I think, it's important to keep the cohort strong, right? And so we're in the process of determining how best to do that as this committee sunsets. Um, but my impression as we've gone through this year, because we've started to talk about it early on in the year, just like uh, my testimony today, we started to talk about this process way back in February, um, at which point we went through some discussions, and thank you to Vice Chair Timmons um, and your stated purpose of we're going to run to the wire, we put that on the back shelf. However, we haven't put on the back shelf the idea of do we stay together. Mm -hmm. um, four years ago, there was there were members who were a smaller cohort. You know, they came together. Two years ago, um, when we weren't sure that the select committee was going to be in extended, it was um, a, a wonderful moment, I think, for the entire cohort, as we were then able to sit around a table um, to gauge the closeness that we had and the trust that we had in each other and how we've grown. Um, and that only has increased over the last two years. And what happens for us is you've witnessed with the um, uh, civility and collaboration working group that we had and the civic engagement working group. We not only pull members of the cohort to work on those issues to come up with recommendations for this committee, but we also pulled from other groups outside of the cohort, whether that's the bridging community or others who are extremely interested in the same same issue. Yeah. So I don't see the cohort going away. Okay. I see the cohort as continuing, um, and I, I, I'm not sure what that, you know, how we'll set that up. We're working on that now. But I think it's, it's important that you know, whoever is working on this issue of modernization, that there is a strong contingent outside of Congress that's very engaged on these issues, and they yeah. care deeply about them. I really appreciate that. That's probably a good point on which to end this discussion, unless anyone has anything burning that they didn't share that they want to. Okay. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank our witnesses for their testimony today, and I'd like to thank our committee members for their participation. Um, I'd like to thank C-SPAN for being here. Thank you. Um, uh, and for Chris, thank you for showing up and um, following the work of our committee. Uh, we're clearly a viral phenomenon at this point. Um, <laughs> I also just want to shout out the staff of our committee um, for the great work that they do setting up amazing hearings, this being our last one. Um, I want to just applaud their uh, uh, excellent work in setting this up. We can literally applaud them if you're up for it. Um, we're not done. We've got a bunch of recommendations we still have to make, and so I'm going to save my um, uh, vicious attacks on Rodney Davis until we get through those, uh, uh, that markup. Um, uh, and my gratitude to the rest of the committee too, I intend to uh, reserve for that. But um, So without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. That objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.